Okay, so now we are live. Okay, good evening. My name is Nkem Kumba, and uh, welcome to this whole session on the, the title, Resistance is the Pandemic 2. Uh, let me start off by thanking Frank and his team for, first of all, thinking about this topic on, on this program for today, and also inviting my, me and my colleagues who are here present to have a robust conversation on the race in America or other race in the whole world as it does in this time of pandemics. Uh, I'm joined here by uh, three good colleagues, who were five of us, but hopefully the other two will join, or otherwise we will keep on. Uh, to, uh, we have uh, Ms. Ife, Ms. Ife Ukela, who is, uh, who is the founder of Impact Her? I'm sure she'll make more comments about her work and how it uh, relates to race and, uh, and, and racism. Uh, Mr. Julian Watts, who is the chairman of the International Consortium of Minority Cyber Professionals in the US, who will hopefully share a little bit more also about uh, his work in that background and how he touches on the race and uh, the STEM workforce demographics in, in the country. And then uh, also uh, with me here is uh, Mr. David Smith, who is the president of Zan, Zan Trust. So we have two people here whose background are in uh, STEM and uh, the corporate sector, and, uh, and uh, Ms. Ife, who would talk to us about uh, talents and uh, workforce development. Now, racism is a, is, has been at the foundation of this country since the inception. From slavery through Jim Crow through the 60s, to our modern times. And each generation has tried to make the case that racism is not a big deal. Only those who feel the effect of racism, like the black and minority communities, talk about it. And so many others who would like to wash it away or not deal with it, or deal with it in their own ways, would always want to make us feel that uh, we want to live by the content of our character, that this country is founded on equality, and the content of our character matters more than anything else. But nevertheless, uh, the George Floyd incident last year opened some deep sores in this country and globally. It, reverber it reverberated and showed us how blacks and other minorities are treated within the legal system, within the police and uh, uh, administrative systems, but also in other sectors of society. Racism apparently permeates all facets of our country, of our globe. Now, uh, the pandemic exacerbated our understanding or the urgency to deal with racism. Um, a recent report by the CDC indicates that the pandemic caused a 2.9% drop in the life expectancy of black people in America, unlike 1% in the, global, in the larger community. That already tells you how much health correlates with racial disparities in the U.S. Besides that, the life expectancy for black folks is 72 years, while for everyone else is 78 years. That's a six-year difference. So while mm -hmm. race is usually seen in sociological terms, historical terms, political terms, the health implications are also vast. The pandemic hit so hard in terms of um, uh, reducing lifespan for so many, taking away on lives unnecessarily. But by the numbers I just gave you, racism has been taking away lives unnecessarily for generations, for decades. So my colleagues here and I will try to look at racism, how it correlates with the pandemic, with or, or generally how it plays in terms of the prospects of, our, of the global society. I will start by uh, asking uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Smith, if you will. Okay. Now, racism seems to permeate all parts of society. Yes. All sectors, the economic sector, the political sector, institutions. And uh, in, in some places, it's, it's hard to see. In some places, it's more overt. People can speak in your mouth or in your face or on the street. People can say nasty things to you. People can love you or not love you. But we all aspire to work in the same corporate sectors, work the same hallways, the same university systems, where this racism is also present. 
These institutions, they have policies in place that sometimes codify implicitly or propagate and permeate these racist attitudes. I work at, uh, uh, if, if you go down to, into uh, uh, universities, for example, the proportion of black students in leading universities is so small compared to their ratio in, in the national demographic. If you go into the top echelons of the top 500 companies, the proportion of minorities in there compared to their numbers in the, in, in the country are very little. So what do you say about how institutions propagate racism or how they could better address racism? Thank you, sir. Um, happy to um, engage you. Um, again, my name is Dave Smith. I'm CEO of a company, uh, Sandrasat. We do satellite uh, engineering, um, and um, we provide it on a global government and commercial environment. Um, how do we see this in institutions uh, as far as corporate Fortune 500? Um, it's um, something that's ingrained in the in the entire system um, that's been there for years as far as racism as far as a system that's 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 in place that can cause certain people to be left out of um, you know opportunities in the fortune 500 companies um, I worked L3 Communications. Um, um, but it is there and it's a system that's in place that the only way I see that it can really be dealt with as a pan is it's in a pandemic. It has to be uprooted and a whole new system has to be put in place. That's I believe it's fair. Now, how does one do that? I don't have that answer. Um, but you know, meaning of the minds have to sit down and work on what is a fair and equitable system. Now, like I said, I deal with the international market, I deal with the commercial market, and I deal with um, uh, government. Uh, sometime within the government sector, I, I found this out, that they have a lot of times are a little ahead of the curve when it comes to racial equality in, in the market. And in, in the commercial world, um, that's where, you know, it, I see it as, as, as running rampant. Now, I hope, hopefully, um, I can, um, I'm not rambling, but specific ways to deal with that. Um, there's a lot, you know, uh, you know, in corporation, you have a minority diversity, uh, you know, minority diversity, uh, personnel that works in the different departments that tries to bring minorities into corporations and stuff like that. Um, and it's, it's a situation where the ones that do get to that level of senior executives, C-level executives, they have to be the ones to try to implement that within the corporations to bring people into um, the company. But a lot of times when they get there, they're just trying to survive. They're just trying to survive in that environment so they don't want to make no waves a lot of times. So I believe that the whole system has to be uprooted because it is a pandemic and that a new system has to be put in place. And what that is, um, that has that has to be discussed. And maybe somebody else can elaborate on that if, if I'm making sense. OK, sure, you do. Sure, you do. I, I get the point very well. I mean, it's so ingrained, the founding of the country, the, the very foundation of the country, the economic system is, is being built up on a free level from for, for some and uh, which ingrained in racism. Now, um, uh, if uh, you and I were talking uh, um, uh, earlier on, and uh, one of the comments that we, we made was that uh, some of these companies, the way they try to deal with racism is to you know, suggest that let's build a colorblind society. 
and just build talents. What the big corporations, what the big companies want is not race, but they want people with talent. But the talent pipeline has its own issues that are out of that history. What do you say to these companies or to these uh, really folks who are doing their best to address racism, improve the uh, prospects for all Americans, who say talent search is the main thing. We want the best talent. We can find them or we have a few. But then the country has a big pool that is not participating fully in, 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 proportionally in, in the economy. What would you say to those people who say talent is all that matters? Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. So to you, you started by talking about the color blindness. And I would say, please do not be colorblind. That is a big problem. Being colorblind means that somehow you're not recognizing the problem already. It doesn't make you look great, but it puts you in a more dire situation because what is telling you is that you're assuming that everybody's on, on equal footing, but guess what? We're not, right? When you recruit, you know, this, this maybe in a, in a first year program at a, you know, Fortune 500 and you get people from inner city schools and you get people from the posh neighborhoods, from the suburbs, right? It's not all equal footing. So we have to recognize that those inequities so that we can then address those. Those institutions have to address those. So you recognize what are the different backgrounds and what kind of policies do we have to make within the organization to make sure that people from those different backgrounds feel like they can bring their best selves to work, feel like they actually belong and not just, you know, a blanket policy. You talked about hiring diverse talents. And of course, we heard in the news years ago about, you know, there's not enough diverse talents out there, but hiring diverse talents is not enough right? You bring them in, but when they sit in their seats, they still remain uncomfortable. What have you accomplished? If I sit uncomfortable in a chair at a, a huge institution, but I'm sort of disturbed by the policies or the way my colleagues treat me, then I'm not bringing my best self to work and I'm, you're not going to get the best you can get out of me because I'm probably thinking about, you know, how will this person treat me when I, you know, submit this proposal? And we've often heard about like black people in the workplace, most of the time having to work twice, thrice as hard as their non-black colleagues to be able to prove themselves, to be able to get people to look past she is black. He is black. Right. Or you submit that piece of work and people say to you, oh, I didn't know you can write. Why? Because of the color of my skin. So institutions have to recognize those problems and figure out how do they address it. So addressing it to me, it's recognizing the diversity you have, recognizing that you have to embrace people with those backgrounds. And what does it mean to retain them? What kind of programs do you need to? Does it mean that you're going to be doing sensitization um, seminars or workshops? Does it mean that we have to dig deeper into people's implicit bias? Because that also exists at the institution. Some people say, oh, no, I don't see race. But when it comes to hiring, you're going to notice that they're hiring people that speak like them, that look like them. And maybe they could get that token, in quote, um, colored person in. But when they give assignments or when it's time for promotion, implicit bias plays a role. And those other um, talented, colored, black or you know, other races do not get that um, promotion that they deserve. But when you look at the person making the decision, those decisions sometimes are not made consciously. We tend to like people that speak like us. We tend to like people that like the kind of things we like. So organizations need to learn how to tackle those issues, give the kind of trainings that will be necessary to make sure that hiring managers, general managers, and, you know, people in leadership become aware of what their implicit bias is, embrace it and learn how to address it. Wow, thank you. Now, I'm uh, Mr. Waite, I was gonna get to you, but give me a second here to welcome our colleague. Uh, I suppose this is uh, Ms. Helen Gale. She just joined us and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Waite, your comments, I think uh, the thing that you, I was hoping that you help us uh, talk about, they're, they're kind of futuristic. <laughs> in this conversation. So let me uh, turn to our colleague first and uh, to Helen and, and, and I'll, I'll get to you. So Helen, yes, you know, it's okay to, to uh, I know you just yes, got in. 
So, uh, first of all, thank you for making the time. I, I recognize how busy you can be uh, with your work at the Chicago Community Trust. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's a busy time there. But uh, you spend almost a lifetime, a very rich career, working at the intersection of uh, race, global health, global development, humanitarian uh, activities. And uh, recently, with this pandemic, you have been at the forefront of working in the greater Chicago area, a very diverse area, pretty much the Midwest, in trying to address the, both the healthcare and or otherwise general um, uh, racial and uh, health uh, issues uh, in that space. Now, before you, before you came in, uh, a comment had been made uh, with some colleagues that, you know, racism kills as much or more than the COVID. Uh, I, I quoted earlier the, the recent, recent CDC report that suggested that uh, uh, due to the pandemic, the life expectancy for black folks in America went down by 2.9%, as opposed to 1% for the larger community. And that number was already down. So from your worth of experience, give us a lay of the land about um, uh, race and health in America. What would you say? First of all, give us first of all a, a little background on, on the community trust and then your, your perception, your, your, your views on race and health in America. Great. Well, thank you very much. And sorry, I had to be a little bit late. We were doing uh, for one of our Chicago um, networks kind of a retrospective on this last year and particularly addressing some of these issues of the disproportionate impact that COVID has had on communities of color. So, you know, I, I you know, um, when I kind of, and you mentioned, you know, my career, I, I'm, a, I'm a physician, a pub, uh, spent much of my time in public health, both in the United States as well as domestically, uh, globally. But, you know, when I started recognizing that in so many ways, the things that really impact our health and the differences in life outcome are not necessarily the things that we think about in our medical toolbox, the health uh, issues, uh, drugs, access to health, all of those things. Yes, those are important and we have to do a better job of making sure that all people have access to essential health services in, in the US and rich nations, but also around the world. But we recognize that the social determinants of health, whether you have a job, access to education, access to nutritious food, a safe environment, a safe um, uh, transportation, all of those factors play an even greater role in determining your health outcome. And that's why when I came to the Chicago Community Trust, uh, where many people would have thought as a doctor I would focus on health, I said, let's focus on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap. Because we know that underneath so many of the issues that we try to face, not only here in this, in the United States, but around the world, you know, the root cause is wealth inequity. And the fact that populations, particularly people of color, have been left out of economic opportunity. And if you are left out of economic opportunity, that pretty much defines almost everything else in your life. Where you go to school, whether you have access to health services, whether you live in a safe neighborhood, whether your neighborhood has a grocery store that, that has nutritious food, all of those things. So, you know, it's why we focused on this issue of the wealth gap, because we believe if we can help to close the wealth gap in Chicago, we can be a model for the rest of the nation, maybe even the rest of the world, and will have an impact on closing the life expectancy gap, which in Chicago, uh, you can live in one part of town and live to 60 years and another part of town and live in not to 90 years. So we have one of the largest life expectancy gaps, 30 years of life expectancy difference. You know, um, and that 30 year life expectancy difference is only five miles uh, in distance across the city. So we've got work to do in Chicago, but we know it's not just Chicago. We know that this issue of race and one's life options is, is a pandemic 
um, and one that I think we've got to put as much effort into as we have for COVID and some of the other issues that we're facing today. Hmm. That, that's quite instructive. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the wealth gap. So the, rac the racism that, that, that we're discussing here, may saying that uh, you know it's been part of the past, part of the, part and parcel of the country's fabric from from its foundation. The country has gone through the uh, agricultural stage, through the industrial stage, and uh, you see. And now we are talking about the digital age, where the wealth creation is coming more out of those with high-end tech skills. And when you talk about wealth gap in Chicago or elsewhere in the country, one wonders, how does one create those, uh, how, how, do, how does one reduce that, given that uh, previous racial uh, disparities have created different pipelines to academic and educational opportunities that could lead into those high-tech and high-skilled jobs. If you look at the workforce of uh, Microsoft, the workforce of Apple, compared to the workforce of maybe um, a Walmart uh, that, 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 has, that has a longer history. Let me turn to uh, Mr. Waits here. He's uh, been doing lots of work in trying to look at this digital economy and this digital skills for the future. Everyone knows the future is digital and it's been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. We're here, not, not physically, we're here virtually. So those who have digital skills, virtual skills, the best STEM education skills have pro better prospects for wealth. So, Mr. Waits, please tell us a little bit about your work with the with the Cybersecurity Consortium and how you see this issue of race and uh, the demographics of the workforce of the future. Sure, and uh, thank you, Kim. And I got to say, I'm I'm honored to be on this panel with with all of you. I am uh, <laughs> I'm a little overwhelmed, actually. You guys are great. Thank you. So uh, my name is Julian Waits. I'm the chairman of the International Consortium of Cybersecurity Minority Minority Cybersecurity Professionals, ICMCP, and I can never say the name right ever. And we've been doing this for seven years. Our sole mission uh, is to bring women and people of color into cybersecurity. When you look at where our world is today and where it's going to be tomorrow, um, our lives are being literally directed by what we see in media by what we're seeing from the standpoint of what we hear from others and how our opinions are being shaped. Uh, starting from the incidents with George Floyd, all the way to the point of what happened on January 6th, we've got nation state actors like the Russians, the Iranians, everybody trying to formulate what we're gonna think about our country and what we're gonna think about what's going on uh, today and tomorrow. The key issue there, and I, I agree with the last panelist, is it starts with, I will add education and the wealth gap. So the reason we started ICMCP, uh, you know, I'm unique. I am a serial entrepreneur. I've founded, my God, six or seven companies, all in high tech, raised money from venture capitalists. The, the, the scary secret that I don't tell anybody is I actually don't have a college degree. But that was driven by the fact that my career started before I could finish college. That's the right way to say it. I actually studied to be a jazz musician and I sucked at that. And math and science turned out to be easier and nobody told me it was supposed to be hard to do computer programming. Um, but early in my career, uh, a white gentleman from Mississippi, because I'm originally from New Orleans, where unlike most of the country, uh, race racism is more hidden when I was coming up in New Orleans in the 80s and the early 90s, it was out there for everybody to see, nothing hidden. But one gentleman in the, in the IT department at, at Chevron where I work saw a spark of light in me and basically changed my life. I say all of that to say this, is until we can understand the, the, the aspect that digital has on all of us, we're gonna be left behind. Some of the people who were hurt the most by what just happened with our government and everything else and the influence campaigns that were going on are people who are uneducated and unaware. And unfortunately, because we don't have the privilege of our white counterparts, that affects many people, especially in the African-American community. As you said, when you first started talking and Kim about how the pandemic affected blacks more than it affected others, why is that? It's because people primarily in service oriented organizations were impacted more than others. I never worried about my job during the pandemic. Actually, I only got busier. 
but it's because in, in my case, right, I've focused on an industry that's going to be in high demand, not just today, but also tomorrow. As I tell many of the people that I mentor, I don't seek a job, I seek a position. I want to be the person who's determining what's happening in the future and helping to guide the future where we come. And digital, the digital aspects of our lives are going to become overwhelming in the next several years. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I, uh, I drive in an electronic car that has the ability to do what's called full self-driving. Now, it doesn't do it well in neighborhoods yet, but on the highway, I don't touch anything. By the time my son, who's 26, has children, and those children grow up, they'll never have to learn how to drive a car. That's how, that's how much our technology is changing around us. So for our community uh, and, and women who are also left out to really get, take advantage of what's happening in the future, it starts with education, and the education is what leads us to wealth and understanding how digital impacts all of us every day. Hmm. And I hope I hope that's helpful. <laughs> sure, sure, that, that, that's quite instructive. So what I, what, what I'm getting here from from uh, from, uh, from, uh, from from you all is that the wealth gap. So uh, racial issues are entrenched and they affect opportunity. There's a wealth gap, and those who have more have more. Those who have more have the opportunity to have more and keep having more. Just like you know, this uh, gap in um, um, wealth that, that we hear on the news all the time. So let me ask um, um, Ife a little bit. Let me look back to, uh, back to Ife. Given the, given the, what, what, what uh, our two previous colleagues uh, just mentioned, what uh, what what do you think about again this issue of uh, talent uh, pipelines? Yeah, we don't want the co we want to encourage uh, corporate leadership to go beyond just talent because the pipeline to, to talent itself is, is, is flawed. What, what, uh, what are your opinion on how to strengthen those pipelines or how those corporate leaders can strengthen those pipelines so that they're not just dealing with one individual of here and there who's uncomfortable in their companies, as you say, but to actually have the access? Because sometimes there's a reality the big players do say very well. They want talent. They want growth. They want productivity. They want competitiveness. So they need a talent. Now, what what would you say about uh, getting that that talent pool, or broadening space and enabling more people to be able to access the uh, the workforce? What echelons that would give them the wealth to have access to healthcare and other opportunities? Um, I think, I mean, at, at least referring to some recent cases I saw where some institutions said again that, you know, they couldn't find diverse talent, right? And I looked around and I thought that was interesting. Um, I think I think institutions need to be very much, much intentional in where are you going to seek talent, right? Are you going to the Ivy League schools? Great. We do have some diverse talents there. But are you also going to other schools that have, you know, the historical black colleges? Are you talking to them? Um, are you putting yourself in the communities that, you know, these other talents are um, besides the, you know, default places? So I think there has to be intentionality there. I also think that institutions also need to put their money where their mouth is as it regards to developing the talent, right? Like, some institutions are really good at having scholarship schemes or summer internship programs because we can't all sit, you know, in a fancy office and expect, you know, this huge pool of diverse talent to show up one day without being intentional to help get them to where they need to get to, right? Mm -hmm. So are, are the institutions being intentional about creating summer programs, creating going into schools that you would find as talents, but the students probably don't even know where the opportunities are, right? Like, or that that company even exists. Like my first practice in law, I never knew it existed, private equity, right? I never knew it existed. It took intentional research for me to find out after I had graduated from law school. So that information, institutions could do better at reaching out. Institutions could do better at putting the information out there, um, creating shadowing programs, even if they can't afford 
you know, um, full internships to give diverse students the opportunity to see what they could become so that, you know, as they make their decisions and as they go through their training process in their colleges and their PhD programs and their law school programs, they are thinking about all these other options. But I think most importantly, I would also add that institutions also, given that some of the bigger ones have the deep pockets, right? They are the deep pockets in the country. They also have a very big role to play in terms of lobbying for the right policies. So let, let me let, let me circle back to uh, to our, our colleague here, Miss Gale. I, I want to circle back to you because uh, you really have a wealth of experience, given how much the diversity of uh, communities that you work with, institutions, pretty much all of Chicago's or Midwest leadership. Uh, if you were to retire today. And given all what you've put into the system to correct some of these uh, um, inequities, what what would you recommend? What do you think would, would be done to create a more fair America? Uh, well, I thought you were going to let me retire. That was sounding pretty good. Um, <laughs> Not without giving us uh, your worth of experience and a sense of guidance for what to do after you retire. All right. Well, 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 well I, I will say one thing about that is, you know, one of the reasons why I actually feel like I can retire before too long uh, is that this next generation coming up behind me is dynamite. And, you know, I, I think about uh, our speaker who was talking about uh, the digital world and the jobs of the future. And, you know, I, uh, I really do believe that young people get it and, you know, want a different world and are equipping themselves differently. You know, that said, you know, I think um, one of the things that I say, you know, um, I've been in, in philanthropy in a, diff in, in a variety of different um roles uh, now at a community foundation. I was at the Gates Foundation for many years. I was in government for many years as a funder. And, you know, you can fund programs. And, you know, we're funding, you know, we're doing a lot of work with So, you know, there's a lot of things that we're putting our money into. But I also think we've got to start thinking about how do we change policy? Because in many ways, it's bad policies that got us to where we are in America. You know, it's things like redlining that denied black people the ability to own homes or only own homes in neighborhoods where there wasn't appreciation. And we know home ownership is one of the ways in which, you know, the middle class has been able to uh, grow in America and have something that they can pass on to their children. So, you know, that's just one example of a policy that robbed uh, people of color from the ability to create wealth. We've got to look at policies um, that help to address those wrongs, but also that help to think about ways of stabilizing uh, financial wherewithal, things like earned income tax credits or um, child savings accounts or caps on predatory lending. You know, in, in Illinois, if you're poor, um, you get charged higher interest to take out loan than if you're somebody who has money. You know, 400 400% interest <laughs> on a payday loan for a poor person. Well, that's just a downward debt spiral that makes being poor, um, you know, really expensive. So it, it's expensive to be poor in America. And mm -hmm. I think we've got to figure out what are some of the ways, not only using money from philanthropy or business or government, but how do we start changing some of the policies that make it easier for people who have been left behind
together and, and, and function well with each other. Uh, what would you say to what uh, our, uh, our speaker just said, Ms. Gale, Ms. Gale, about this policy and institutions and their role in either permeating, strengthening, or at least helping us create a more fairer America? Oh, I, I totally agree with policies and procedures. Um, in the corporate infrastructure, uh, in our society, this is what makes the country, the United States, the way it is, because we have strong policies and procedures. Now, does the policy and procedures apply to certain groups of people and don't, or it's not being applied to everyone? Even though we put policies and procedures in place, are they going to be implemented within the organization? Because a lot of people, a lot of times, in corporations and organizations they put a lot of things down but are is it being implement, implemented and uh, see when uh Martin Luther King came along he what was there he just implemented but yes we first have to start there with policies and procedures but are they going to be implemented in them organizations or are we going to be educated enough to know that they are in place when we go into them organizations that we can Glean thereby. Do we have, uh, do we have all the information on 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 the handbook? Do we have that? Do we understand that? Do are, are we going to 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 take that information and apply it to the corporation? Because uh, I, I I just give you could uh, I, I had a couple friends of mine that uh, work for uh, Mectronics, a major um, a major uh, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, well uh, more of, uh, more of a um, medical device company and they implemented that and they had to, but they had to sue the company and and him and his boss were awarded boss was awarded two million dollar lawsuit and his um and he was awarded a million dollar lawsuit because of he took that information applied but in at the end of the day he had to walk away from the company to both of them after they were after they won the lawsuit so are we even though we need to do that but are we are we bringing people back into the co company, um, you know, people of uh, people of color back into the company to basically move forward? And a lot of times, companies, because of that, sometimes they, they the policy and procedures are there, and it it has a tendency if somebody uses it to their advantage, they'll they won't bring that that person of color back in there to 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 uh, because of them reasons. You 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 know. So I'll leave it. At that. Okay. Sure. So, uh, so um, uh, we, we have just about a minute and a half to go. Let, let me wrap it up this way. So, uh, I, 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 mean, I want to thank you for for all your comments, but they boil down to this: that uh, the history of racial inequities in the country have created a reality where, you know, within five miles, there's a thirty-year, five-mile community difference, distance. There's a thirty-year life expectancy gap. And uh, the U.S. is a powerful country. They want to stay powerful and competitive. But then the racial inequities in the country are holding a big chunk of its workforce ineffective, unparticipatory. Actually, about 20, 12 years ago, the National Academy of Science put out a report that really called to action. It titled it The Gathering Storm. That is a storm gathering yeah. of the country. That what the country needs is a solid technological workforce, the, for, the workforce of the future, of, of the digital age. And if policies are not changed, to take advantage of its full citizenry, all of them, and instead of rely on bringing expatriate or immigrant level from outside, then the country will be weaker. So the, uh, there is the COVID and the healthcare disparity, but there's also the survival of the country at stake, where if everyone doesn't participate, and carry the flag of the country and bring its best creativity and its best um, efforts to bear on the country's development, then as someone mentioned, the country will be poorer. Bad policies make the country poorer, not richer. So uh, I want to thank you all for your, your comments. I'm sure Frank will be very happy with this conversation and, and the rest of the Horaces community. I want to thank Jerry and Christopher and all the other listeners who, uh, who followed us uh, live all throughout. And, uh, Wish you all well uh, for the rest of the evening and uh, until uh, 
the lockdowns are over and we can see the sun very brightly again outside. Thank you.